Hi, everyone. I am Kayla Moore. I'm a songwriting coach and the author of Your Path to Songwriting Success, Seven Steps to Becoming a Confident Songwriter. And if you're a person who not only wants to write your own songs, but you want to sing them as well, then this is definitely an interview for you. Because today, we're going to talk about, you know, the importance of learning how to use your voice in a healthy way. And today, my special guest, is Leora Nasco Passmore. Leora is an amazing vocal coach and a musician. She's worked with contestants for The Voice, American Idol Hollywood, and America's Got Talent. She's also the co-founder of Calabra Music, an online educational program for music instructors and students. Hi, Leora, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, thanks for having me. So Leora, can you please tell us a little bit more about your background and what made you decide to become a vocal coach? Uh, yeah, I love this story. <laughs> I love it, especially for to tell students this story, you know, or any anyone, people think student, I think young person, but anyone who's aspiring to make a change in their life because it wasn't um, a calculated decision for me. I um, was coming out of a successful career in the advertising world and realizing that I wanted to make a career change. Um, and as I decided to make the change, I really didn't have any other, I didn't know what marketable skills I had, right, yeah. to use to make money. So the first thing I thought was, well, I had one I had years and years of a classical background in piano. And so I knew, uh, I knew that I could probably teach piano if I wanted to, but mm -hmm. I only had taught like one person up to that point. Uh, mm -hmm. This is by the way, when I was in my late twenties, when I was making all these decisions and it really hit 30 and just kind of mm -hmm. turned my whole life upside down. Um, so, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll go into teaching and I, I went to a local music store and um, got a job as a piano instructor there. But over the months of you know being there and teaching piano, the owner of the store, who ended up being a remarkable and incredible mentor for me, his name is Mark Maxwell of Maxwell's House of Music in Jeffersonville, Indiana. And um, he, encouraged me to teach voice and the reason that he knew that I could and wanted me to was I had been taking lessons in voice really seriously for about um four years uh this is on this timeline of me changing to be a piano instructor then I also started taking a lot of lessons and so over that four year period as he got to know me and I was teaching in the store he was watching me like I would go into um uh, band coaching sessions. We had a big auditorium there. And so we would coach bands and I would just watch him coach the bands and the lead singer would be up there and he'd be trying to get the lead singer to do something. And I'd say, I, you know, maybe if you just try this, like it might help, <laughs> they'd try it and it would help. And so eventually Mark was like, you need to be teaching voice. Wow. Uh, and I'm, no, no, I don't really think so. I'm a, I'm a student, you know, and I'm not teaching it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, so it's funny because then he didn't listen to me at all. <laughs> and it was almost like the next day I went into work to meet with one of my piano students mm -hmm. and the guy at the front desk said, Hey, um, by the way, you're going to see, you know, an extra student tonight at five 30. Um, it's a voice student. And I was like, I don't teach voice. And he was like, yeah. Uh, Mark said you'd be mad. That's right. So, um, so yeah, so that was my first voice student. I remember that lesson. I remember how I wasn't prepared with the curriculum or anything. Uh -huh. Um, but, but, uh, it, apparently it was good because 
before I knew it, I had 35 students on my what? roster. It was more than I could handle. Yeah, I had to, like I went through a huge process of just putting the brakes on and cutting students back because it was because they were just flowing. That's great though, that's amazing. <laughs> and in the in 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 the midst of all of this, I had been uh, Eric Arsenault was one of the people that I was training with, mm -hmm. and he also said then almost simultaneously with Mark, "Hey, would you consider um, getting certified in coaching for me?" And and I think you know. That actually happened a little bit after Mark asked me to start teaching because I had already secretly started to kind of desire that with him. Oh, okay. So when he asked me, I was like, "Yes, absolutely." Perfect. And, uh, yeah. So since then, that's that's how I got into it. But I think the point that I want to emphasize a point here, and that is that there were five years of really dedicated lesson taking, I mean, obsessive lesson taking, mm -hmm. again, four to five days a week with various instructors, which some instructors would say is, um, there's a word I'm looking for, but you know, they would say, that's not right. It's, it's, you're not supposed to take lessons with more than one instructor. That's never been my position on it. And I was certainly doing that unethical is what they would say. Okay. Um, but I was doing that. And, and because I did that for that extended period of time and I recorded all of those lessons and I listened back obsessively and wow. made notes. And I mean, it was just all in. Yeah. All in for four to five years. So that was what prepared me. I, at the time, I thought I was training to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I did carry that that knowledge forward into my artistry. But, right. um, you know, I want, I think, you know, whenever I talk to students or address anyone of any kind who might be learning or interested in this story, the thing I want to emphasize is that period of time. It wasn't just like somebody asked me to be a voice teacher and I was like, no, I don't want to do it. And then I was a voice teacher. Right. <laughs> I had a whole it's lot a of work. Yeah. <laughs> I had a whole lot of information and um, study that had led me up to that point. I just needed someone who really saw maybe the potential in me to be mm -hmm. good at that and push me over the line. And then consequently, in as much resistance as I, and I really had resistance in the beginning to doing that. Uh -huh. it, it, I emphasize now it's my life's work. This is what I was born to be a coach of some kind, you know, whether that's breath work or voice or piano, I love teaching. And that this, this is at the top of the pyramid of all the facets of my life, which are, there's multiple facets right. um, as an athlete or, you know, as a lot of different things that I do, but the coaching is- I'll do athlete too, yeah. we definitely have to talk offline about that because I need to get back in shape. <laughs> I used to be an athlete way back in the day, but I don't know what's going on with me now. <laughs> We're going to have talks for sure. And there's so much cool crossover, you know, between the mm -hmm. way that the discoveries you make in music and the discoveries you oh, make. Oh yeah, that's that's so true. That's so true. Like the the focus, the flow, the flow state is something that I remember being in when I used to run in college and in high school. And it's the same state as when you're writing songs or performing. Yes. Oh my gosh, it really is. There's so yeah. much to say there. But yeah, that's just coming out of me saying um mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of focused work that led yeah. me to that. And then um and, but now it's not, it's not an afterthought. It's not a thing that I settled for. It's, it's a thing that I very deliberately have chosen yeah. and, and, I, and I love it. Um, and it might be my defensive way of, of raging against the saying, those who can't do teach. Cause I don't, <laughs> I don't like that at all. I have a whole, there's a whole, we can have a whole separate podcast on yeah, just we the paper can. Matter. Definitely. <laughs> so, um, you know, lots of songwriters, they want to sing their own songs and or present them to other people and they want to do it well. So I think vocal training, you know, it not only helps them gain more skills, but it also boosts their confidence. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but <laughs> I get so many students who the, I, I can hear it in their voice and I tell them as much. You, the ability is already there within you. You you can already make the sounds that you want to make. The barrier is psychological. Yeah. And so Eric and I have this conversation. We just, again, last Friday, you know, about how more often than not, we are, <laughs> I'm not a trained psychiatrist. <laughs> I don't <laughs> claim to be, um, but we're, the, the mental aspect of it is really important. 
it, yeah. that's not there it doesn't matter the the skill i could teach you all the best exercises in the mm -hmm. world yeah um, but yeah you have to you have to, you believe. Have, to have the right mindset definitely yeah definitely so um why else do you think vocal training could be like important for a songwriter it's can see my eyes it's a hot button for me uh, <laughs> I'll start out by saying this. I can't believe, and I'm not the first person to say it. I, I'm saying it, having heard other people say it and going, yes. And I testify. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I can't believe that record companies, uh, that booking agencies, it, anyone who stands to make money off of an artist and there's the, there's lines mm -hmm. <laughs> right? people, yeah. Uh, Especially when you get an artist as big as Adele, you know, let's use her as an example. Mm -hmm. um, I can't believe that it's just not standard or protocol that they would protect their investment with, um, with voice training. Okay. Uh, that would be, I'm trying to, you know, think of a, a, a a clever metaphor, but I don't really even think it's necessary right now is if you take, let's take Adele, for example, mm -hmm. and there's controversy around this, what I'm about to say. So I'll just, you know, I'm being transparent about it. Adele's uh, surgeon, she, Adele has had three surgeries on her vo voice that yeah, I know I of. Know that. There may be, there may have been another one since the last time I'm aware, but yeah. for sure three. Uh, and, and there's a huge article written about this. I pass it along to my students a lot because her surgeon would say, um, this is inevitable, Adele. He did say, and mm -hmm. he's quoted as saying, you know, this is inevitable. Any artist who's using their voice as much as these artists use it in the way that they're using it um, are going to get injured and they're going to need surgery and you just come right on back in whenever you get injured again <laughs> and we'll fix you oh my goodness when they get fixed though is it back to normal or is it is it ever the same great question okay so i'm not a speech therapist but eric is certified in many ways and i'm the more i learn from him the more i close that gap because that's actually a big passion of mine just in the next year to really uh understand the therapy aspect of it more but one thing i want to say to you what you you know to your question is when uh anyone injures their voice lots of people injure their voices just talking in their daily job they do it inefficiently they don't breathe effectively they develop a rasp before they know it they've got nodules or nodes mm -hmm. uh, they go to speech therapy and they do all of these nice you know lip rolls and hums and things that restore um flexibility and connection seal to the vocal cords um and then you know maybe they have to get those you know when you get a, a polyp or something on your vocal cords. I'm holding my fingers up like this. They really lay horizontally in your throat, by the way, just in case anybody's trying to scrutinize everything I say. <laughs> um, it, you know, you get these little bumps on the inside of your vocal cords and, and that therapy either helps to just kind of reduce that back down so you get a proper seal in your uh, vocal folds again, or they have to shave it off. Um, right with surgery. Now, when they used to do that, like Julie Andrews, for instance, had that this done, I'm not an expert in her situation, but from what I understand, when they did that back for Julie Andrews, by the way, she's saying in the sound of music, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, it's Mary Poppins too. Yeah. yeah for you <laughs> listeners, you know, who are like, well, yeah. is that, um, <laughs> When they did that to her, they didn't have the same precision in the surgery as they do now. Mm -hmm. They shaped just a little bit too much off and, it, and that was permanently damaging yeah. for her. Okay. And I think there's probably tons of other stories out there of other artists who went, you know, through that kind of surgery and they never were able to come back now. I mean, granted again, Adele's had the surgery three times and she's still, you know, she sounds good still. I heard her on SNL, it wasn't too long ago, a few months ago, and she still, you know, sounded really good. So um, it works. But the other thing I want to say about that, though, is that they do, you know, in speech therapy, you do all these exercises that restore the connectivity of your vocal cords and, and you get back and you can sing again. But the same 
deficiency in uh, the same lack of support exists. So you fix your vocal cords and you can sing fine. Now I gotta be- Temporarily. <laughs> go back to the big belt notes, right? And you're trying to, it's, we, could, we could compare it to lifting weight and you're trying to lift this weight using muscles that are inefficient in the body. So you're trying to lean on the muscles of your neck or your shoulders, or your face muscles get really tight. Um, and again, all of these conversations, okay, I could spin off and talk about that one issue. I mean, I fill up a whole hour's worth of a, of a lesson talking about the nuances of this. So while I'm being uh, kind of overly reductive right now, I want you know, anyone who listens to the podcast to understand there's a whole lot more layers to this conversation than just right. me trying to give it to you in a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they come back and they're fine. Sometimes they come back and they're fine momentarily, but when they go back to the activity they were doing, they didn't retrain mm -hmm. how to do what it was that messed them up from the beginning. So they end up right back in the same situation. And I know for a fact that Eric Arsenault has trained and rehabilitated and re rehabilitated mm -hmm. multiple people, Broadway singers, especially who have gone through this because of the way that they have to project their voice. But for the most part, they can pretty much prevent it if they have the right skills and techniques, right? There are very well educated coaches, coaches with decades more experience than I am bringing to the table mm -hmm. saying, um, pa Paglin and Brilla are two that were interviewed in this particular article about Adele saying, it doesn't have to be this way. Adele, come on over and we will, we will help you. You don't have to keep going back uh, to surgery. You can learn to do this a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always like to throw this quote out at my students because it's, it's from a famous philosopher, uh, Toffler. Mm -hmm. And he said, the illiterate of the future are not those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that is the probably the biggest barrier you know, when you think not, not just it, we're talking about physical stuff right now. We're talking about physical technique, but you know, we were talking about emotional or psychological yeah. work as well. That's all you learned things, you know, you've been yeah. taking in images since you were oh, a baby goodness. and learning to feel a certain way about yourself. Mm -hmm. That's also something to unlearn and relearn. Yeah. So unlearn. just life in general. <laughs> Everything, everything, everything that I teach in voice. I mean, almost everything, these principles are so like centric to life they, they really apply to a lot more than just singing they're coming from outside of singing they're based in right. spirituality or you know again they yeah. could apply to athletics or business success all kinds of different um oh you know verticals mm -hmm. <laughs> if you say it that way yeah. so yeah i that's a lot I, I don't know if i got a soft track but the voice that's training true. i said it's amazing that the labels and um everyone who's invested in this artist, mm -hmm. that they don't pay attention more to the protection of the artist's voice because if they can't sing, no, nobody's going to make right. money. Yet you still see it. I'm going to say this girl's name so wrong. Crazy. Pop singer, uh, S-Z-A, SZA. Is that how? I've never even tried to pronounce her name. <laughs> you and I, we both know who we're talking about. I know who you're that talking girl about. just went through the same thing uh, and she was getting steroid injections. Oh, wow. right? That's what they'll do. They'll pu keep pumping you up until you're right. just so fretted. Uh, oh. I think she's coming back now. Again, I don't always follow these stories to the end, but what I do see is the big headline that comes through that, blam, so-and-so artist has had to cancel all these dates. Oh gosh, uh, that happened to me when I went to see Celine Dion in Vegas one time. She, I got there and they canceled the show because she had to have a surgery. Yeah. And yeah. she's one who then once she sought out a really good voice coach, mm -hmm. um, and she, she's probably had several, all of these artists have gone through several, uh, you know, Beyonce, uh, Whitney Houston, lots of these people had several, they also had kind of one primary person that was following them. Lady Gaga takes mm -hmm. regular voice lessons and been working with the same man for oh. several years. But, you know, from what I understand from her story, she sought that out herself where Adam Lambert's been working with the, well, he doesn't work with this woman anymore, but he worked with a woman from the time he was 12 until he, you know, kind of flew. Wow. Best and um, 
But these artists have sought that out themselves. And then you look at uh, some of them and see what was their propensity uh, or their rec their track record for getting injured or not. Mm -hmm. And then even if they had voice lessons, that doesn't automatically protect them because there's so many other things that you can end up doing, like talking too much after the gig is over or drinking right. and smoking uh, that that are gonna, you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You can't outrun those bad behaviors, but nonetheless, voice lessons, if for no other reason, if an artist is truly serious, um, they're going to need to learn how to protect their voice. In the mm -hmm. case of Jennifer Hudson, for instance, who Eric rehabilitated, uh, he, is, he was not her voice coach, but he was called, from what I understand, by her ENT, her ear, nose, and throat doctor, when she was injured and said, can you help this client of mine? She's high profile. He didn't know who she was, I don't think, at the time. And then, But he did. He was part mm -hmm. of her rehabilitation after she was injured. Mm -hmm. There's a perfect example, and this would be maybe the big takeaway for your listeners, perfect example of a woman who sounded great mm -hmm. in spite of her inefficiencies so there's like a headline statement an artist can sound wonderful in spite of their inefficiencies needing to be trained is not um does not equate to sounding bad right. you might sound wonderful and be doing things really inefficiently and I promise you, it's going to catch up with you. It caught up with her, Whitney Houston, Celine Dion, wow. uh, Jordan Sparks, John Mayer. It, I mean, just wow. the list goes on. Miley Cyrus, all of these people mm -hmm. um, we could point to and go, it, it'll catch up eventually unless you just have an outstanding gene genetical code that resists that kind of injury. Mm -hmm. um, but for most people, the training is important coming yeah. back. The, your initial question yeah definitely because you want to protect your the your thing your livelihood yeah. yeah yeah thank you so much for that You're welcome. <laughs> yeah um i also wanted to talk about um you know i talk about law of attraction a lot with people and my clients and i tell them you know whatever you desire you have to have faith and know that it's it's already yours right so in that vein like when you go out and you do things, try to do it from inspired action and the inspired action from being on a high vibration. Like if you're feeling good and you feel inspired to do something, go for it because it's going to lead you to something that's going to maybe lead you to something else that's going to lead you to your desire. You never know how it's going to come about or anything like that. So that's something they shouldn't worry about, but definitely have faith and know follow your inspired action and just see where it takes you. And I remember you telling me a story once about a book you read by Jack Canfield and he's all about law of attraction. And can you please share that story? Because I think it's amazing and it totally proves that point that I was trying to make. I would love to. This, it, it seems unreal. Even when I tell it, I could, I could feel the doubt in people's <laughs> perception in the story. So I actually brought props. <laughs> um, the book that you're referring to is is this book here. It was given to me by uh, one of my musical mentors, Harry Pickens, who's an internationally known jazz piano player and motivational speaker. So he was already into that stuff, you know, mm -hmm. how to motivate people, how to reach your full potential. And, and he would have, you know, his own constructive criticisms maybe about, you know, I, meant, I said the phrase earlier, overly reductive, right? And you and I have talked about off the record, like the secret and things kind of present this, these concepts as being a little overly reductive. And so, you know, but you, I love your term, your words, the inspired action, right? I have to take action. So I was reading this and you can see by the way that it's falling apart, <laughs> And the um, yellow, yellowed <laughs> appearance of the book itself and the margins and the stars. <laughs> I was taking a lot of inspired action at the time. Nice. I was in this book like, um, you know, it was like being in a college class. People actually teach. They have whole classes that will take you through the whole book. And there's about 65 lessons in wow action steps to, that he outlines in the book mm -hmm. I think it's really great for, especially for young people who don't kind of yet know how to act like a professional and take mm -hmm. action steps every day they just don't have that kind of training okay. um so okay so here's a little apple sticker there on the front my fruit <laughs> on the book that's funny um okay <laughs> 
So I was reading this book and one of the action steps that Jack talked about he had taken, and I might get part of this story wrong, but it doesn't matter. Read the book, you know, and figure out where I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> the point is that I think it was when he was, was planning to write Chicken Soup for the Soul. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that book, right? But at yeah. the time when he was planning for that, he was relatively unknown. Nobody yeah. knew who he was. He didn't have right. publishers lined up at his door to publish his books. Right. Um, but he had a partner that he was trying to write this book with. And he said, it's important to have kind of one focus goal. Um, and you write that focus goal somewhere that you're going to see it every day. He said he wrote his on his business card and he put it in his wallet. And it was, I guess, you know, maybe in the see-through pane of his old school wallet. And he, every day when he flipped his wallet open, he would see yeah. Yeah. the goal written there. So I thought, well, that's a great idea. I'll do that. And I did it. I wrote on, at the time, my again, this was before I started teaching, my goals were different. Uh, I, I was very focused on becoming an artist. So, but I had never been in the studio. I was writing songs. I had never recorded anything. I had no experience on any tour or any proper, no studio at all, not even a proper studio, let alone. Um, so I wrote on the card uh, that I wanted to go into the studio and record a song by a particular date. That's another thing that I really learned from Jack and I teach it to all my students still mm-hmm. is when you have goals, you have, to, you have to measure them. And so you ask these two questions, how much, by when, yeah. by him. So the how much was one song and the by when was the date, whatever. I wish I had my actual business card that I had that written on mm-hmm. long gone. Um, Cause again, this is like 15 years ago. Um, but I wrote- 15 the years song. flies by. <laughs> I wrote the goal on a business card. And at the time I had just started working at a dueling piano club. And uh, the I live in Louisville, Kentucky. And that year the Ryder Cup came to Louisville, which is a huge like international golfing tournament, which draws, again, a lot of high, uh, you know, profile, oh, yeah. big money mm-hmm. people. And the club, the dueling piano club where I worked, would attract that kind of clientele when they came in town because they didn't want to go to the bumping, you know, nightclub with, right, right. <laughs> with all the girls rocking their express outfits. <laughs> um, I don't think it's that. I like shopping at Express when I was that age. I went to the club. <laughs> uh, but those guys didn't want to go there. You know, right. they came into the club where we were sitting at pianos and they could bring up requests and we could play songs to them. So this man comes in one night and, um, Uh, when I went on my break, he pulled me aside and he said, hey, you know, in this French accent that I'm not going to try to imitate. (laughs) He said, hey, you know, is this, is this like what, what, is this what you want to do the rest of your life? He wasn't downing it. He was just like, tell me about what you do. Like, I really enjoy your voice. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. And because I was in this book, Mm -hmm. I had given that a lot of thought. Right. Now, had I not been able to answer, I, I answered him and I had a really, I had really specific answers. I was like, well, actually, no, this, I just kind of consider this job like a way to get better at playing and singing tunes because what I'm really trying to do is this thing as an artist. And he was like, have you recorded anything yet? Can I go somewhere and buy your music? And I was like, no, not yet. You know, it's so expensive to go into the studio. And so, but I want to record a song by this date. And I want to, you know, I want to meet Glenn Ballard by this date. I want to win a Grammy <laughs> and all my goals set up for like the next 15 years. I didn't win the Grammy, um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, got, I got close in, in a good enough kind of way. So I'm going to say that I had a really, a spe- I had really specific answers. Right. Um, and I think that that was meaningful to him. He, uh, as it turns out, was a very successful man in his own right. I'm not gonna say the company that he was working for. I have his business card here still, um, but it was out of, out of Paris, France. And his name uh, was Bruno. Bruno Chaper, I don't think anyone could even find them if they tried now based on mm-hmm. my saying his name, but just to add, you know, validity to the story. He listened to me. He encouraged me. He, he stayed for a little bit of the next set and then he left. 
And when I, he actually, before he left, he asked me, what time do you get done tonight? seemingly maybe a threatening type of question, but my husband always picked me up from work. So I wasn't worried. I was like, well, you know, we tend to, you know, we close down about this time. So right before I was done with the last set, here he comes walking in. And when I finished the last set, I was, you know, packing up my microphone and everything at the piano. And he walked up and he handed me this envelope, which I have kept all these years with money stuffed inside of it. And he said, Leora, I don't want anything from you. I just want you to know that I really support you. I was touched by your uh, story and, um, and your, he had a way of phrasing it, but it was basically saying what I'm saying to you, which was how, how specific I was on my goals right. that I had, you know, a plan. Right. And so he's like, I, I, I just want to random act of kindness, you know, <laughs> to give this to you. And he shook my hand and he walked out the door and I never saw that man or talked to that man again in my life. I love that story. The outside of this envelope, just to read you this, he, all this message on here. I ran into the bathroom and went into the stall to <laughs> pull this money out and counted it. There was a thousand dollars cash in the envelope. Um, and it said, lovely Leora, you have such an extraordinary voice and your approach, uh, his English is not so good. So your approach to music with so you approach music with so much passion, class, respect, and dedication. So a real artist, and I mean it, go by your own, go on, go on your own way, right? right? right. Go by your own, create your own music, express through music, all the strong feelings you went through and all of your wished feelings. I can't wait uh, hearing your first album. Oh my uh, gosh, that's beautiful. So, uh, that is beautiful. I so love it. It was, it was really sweet. Um, I can't say I never heard from him again. I did reach out to him, you know, a couple of times and he encouraged me, but it wasn't like, you know, I just really want to emphasize that this man wasn't trying to be indecent anyway. He, he was very respectable. I think that he genuinely wanted that he had probably plenty of money to do whatever he wanted in life. And he just saw this girl up on stage and, uh, and liked, yeah. you know, wanted to make a little gesture, an unexpected gesture to a person who would have never expected or wasn't asking for it. And he right. knew that I would use the money, to, you know, for the thing. And I did, I did yeah. use the money to go and record my first song. Um, so that if I don't, you know, when we talk about law of attraction, I was doing a lot of things and I had, I still have some of these like black note cards and I bought silver pens and I wrote my goals and I hung them from the mirror. Um, but you know, the other thing I want to emphasize about that is in as specific as I was about all these goals and the dates and, and many of those goals never coming to fruition, what it did um, was it kept me as one of my students said, I kept making moves. Yes. Every day I saw those goals and I made a move towards the goal. Right. It, it, what I didn't realize then was I was actually making moves towards my life's career in teaching. Yep. I never would have been able to connect with Eric or even the owner of this music store in the way that I did. These folks wouldn't have seen the potential in me right. to be a good teacher if I didn't, if I hadn't been acquiring all of these skills or, you know, I ended up um, supporting another artist uh, while I didn't go on tours myself as an artist, I realized organically, that's not what I want, but I did end up supporting other artists um, and exploring what is it like to go on tours? What yeah. is it like to record in real studios? What is it like to design and develop synth parts for these folks in their mm -hmm. albums and, and then is that the avenue that i want to go i had a taste of all of these different things and what a luxury because then i got to decide this yep. is for me this isn't for me right. i don't go on the road 40 days i don't right. <laughs> right. Right. i don't and i'm not you know so no not so organically motivated even to sit down and write music every day like mm -hmm. all the songwriters in nashville that i saw they were just organically doing that or you listen to jay-z interviewed by a it's a great interview um by david letterman recently and he said i was just writing all the time that's yeah. all i wanted to do 
Well, I think right. this, what I'm doing with you right now, what you want to do. this is all I want to do is right. get, take in information and give it right back to somebody. And this, yeah. I can't, I can't contain it. I'll, I go over with my students and lessons. I give away probably three hours of free time at the end of the week, every week for all that I go over. So, yeah. so all of that, all the goal setting, the intention setting, people might say, well, I don't know exactly where is all this leading? Where do I want to go? It's not so important. I, I didn't, I was setting goals towards things I never really made it to, but it's all was, about the journey at the end of the day. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was actively yeah. pursuing mm-hmm. something that was of value. Yes. My students, I'm putting money in the bank of me yes. so that I have something of value to offer. And it, it turned out it was, I wasn't offering it on a stage to a crowd of 2000 people, mm-hmm. not for me as, as an artist anyway, but um, but I am offering it over, you know, the last decade to hundreds of students and, you know, I, hopefully at the end of my life to thousands of people. That is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your gifts with the world. Thank you so much. Thanks. thanks. And thank you for talking with me this evening, taking out the time to do this. How can people reach you if they want vocal lessons or if they want to know more about you? Do you have a website, email, Facebook? Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have all of those things. And actually, I just met um, with somebody who's revamping everything for me uh, mm-hmm. last week. So a lot of stuff will kind of go offline here in the next couple of weeks and then come back. But an easy way to reach me is through the A Approach, through Eric Arsenault's website, which is aapproach.com. And it's spelled A A P P R O A C H.com. A letter A approach, <laughs> meaning arsenal approach, right? Dot com. And then when you go there, you can look at instructor profiles and there's um, a video of me. It's kind of, it's an old video. This is part of like the remake of my right. branding, I guess, if you will, that's getting ready to happen. The right. older video of me talking about more of myself as an artist, but now, you know, I would talk about athleticism and all the things that I've been doing yeah. in the last eight years. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so they can find me through Eric Arsenault's website um, or people could email me directly at Leora Nosco uh, at gmail.com, okay. you know, which is L E O R A N O S K O at gmail.com. They could reach out directly to me. Um, okay, great. Thank you so much. And for all of you aspiring songwriters out there, if you're ready to write that song that's in your heart and you are looking for someone to guide you, definitely reach out to me. Send me an email at klamour04 at gmail.com. That's K-A-Y-L-A-M-O-U-R-04 at gmail.com. And we can schedule some time to chat and see how I can help you with that. Once again, thank you so much, Liara, for spending this time with us. I appreciate it so much. And the information note, the information was so helpful. So everyone, happy songwriting and good evening. Bye. Bye. <laughs>